So I'm going to give a, a, a bit of an overview of dimension. I know some of that may be redundant. We'll go through that fairly quick. I want to talk about the uh, treatments that we have available to us now. And then I want to spend a fair amount of time talking about research. And, and I'm hopeful we're on the verge of hearing some uh, really interesting research results here in the next few weeks. So with that, uh, kind of the general outline, I'll give some general background. We'll talk about major causes of dementia again. Uh, we'll talk about treatment and we'll talk about research. So uh, first is background. Uh, given today, I, I felt that I had to include this slide. Today uh, is the anniversary of the first description of Alzheimer's disease. And on the left, you see uh, Dr. Alice Alzheimer, who originally described this condition in a patient, Frau Augusta Detter. Uh, this was back in 1906. And at that time, nobody really paid too much attention with one exception, Emil Kraepelin, one of his colleagues, uh, coined the term then Alzheimer's disease. But for, for many decades, it was thought that this was a relatively rare disease. And it's only been in the last, you know, probably 40 to 50 years that people have realized just how important uh, this is and just what a major problem it is. So let me talk a little bit about cognition in general. Uh, so when we think about cognition and aging, we think about it along a spectrum. So we have successful aging where there's no change at all. We may have usual aging where we'll have some minor cognitive changes that we often see with age, but important to note, those are typically pretty minor. And then we have impaired aging, and, and that takes us into two broad categories, mild cognitive impairment and dementia. And if we look at that more graphically, you can see over to the far left, this is successful aging. And then this would be the AAMI is more that typical a, uh, aging where there might be a slight decline cognitively and, and truly slight to the degree that many people, most of us don't notice this at all. But if we start to have more impairment, we fall into that mild cognitive impairment range. And if we have yet more, we fall into a, a range of dementia. So, so what does that really mean? So mild cognitive impairment means that I have an impairment in one or more sphere of cognition, if you will. So perhaps it's affecting my memory, perhaps it's affecting my language, my attention, my executive function, my ability to organize, plan, or any combination of those. The point is I have some measurable decline or impairment in cognition, more than I could explain just with normal aging. But importantly, it's not impairing my daily function. My activities of daily living, we often call them, are still pretty intact. But if that progresses and now gets to a degree where I have impairments in multiple areas of cognition and it is impairing my daily function, then we would use the term dementia. Now, it's important to note, not all mild cognitive impairment necessarily progresses to dementia. In fact, sometimes we refer to mild cognitive impairment as an unstable diagnosis. And this kind of illustrates this. I may start out with normal aging. I may decline and go into mild cognitive impairment. Now, I may stay in mild cognitive impairment. I may progress to a dementia or I may revert to normal aging. Uh, and there are sizable percentages of people that go in each of those three directions. Um, so it's important not to think that mild cognitive impairment inevitably means we're leading to dementia, but it is an, it may be an imp important precursor for many of us. So dementia, again, it's a condition where I have impairments in multiple spheres of cognition and to the degree that it's impairing my day-to-day -day activities. I need help with medications, finances, meals, some aspect of my day-to-day -day function. And as you heard, this is an umbrella term. There are many individual causes of dementia. Now, they largely fall under four categories, but there is a very large number of potential causes. So what are those? Well, Alzheimer's disease, certainly the most common. And uh, as you heard quite correctly, 60 to 80% of individuals with dementia, uh, the cause of that dementia is Alzheimer's disease. And it is marked by impairments in memory, 
in early on, particularly recent or short-term memory. Then you have vascular dementia, and obviously it's associated with vascular disease. Uh, and often with that, we'll see what's termed a disexecutive syndrome. I have more problems with planning, with organizing, with handling complicated tasks. Uh, my overall cognition might be slower. Then we have dementia with Lewy bodies. And that falls into that spectrum essentially with Parkinson's disease. So we may see physical changes that look a, a little like Parkinsonism. We may be slower, we may be stiffer, we may have more trouble getting out of a chair or ambulating across the room. There are often marked fluctuations, very significant ups and downs. And we often see hallucinations and in particular visual hallucinations, seeing uh, people or animals. And then frontotemporal dementia, and I'm not really gonna talk about this much. It in a sense is its own category by itself. Uh, there are multiple individual categories that fall under this. Uh, you'll often see personality changes or uh, really marked changes in language. So let's talk about Alzheimer's disease a little more specifically. So it's insidiously progressive, very hard to say really when it began. Uh, very early on, it's a problem with short-term memory or better yet, uh, a problem with learning. I'm not able to lay down new memories effectively or as effectively, so I don't recall what I said earlier, or I don't recall where I placed something earlier, or I don't recall a recent event. Now, things that happened 20 years ago, in a sense, that's stored in a different part of the brain. So I may hold on to those remote memories very well, but I have trouble forming new memories, so my short-term memory is more effective. Um, and as a result, I'll misplace things. I may repeat myself. Now, as the condition progresses, I may have more trouble with my visual spatial function, I may get lost or disoriented more easily. I may start having more language problems, coming up with the right word or producing the wrong word. That may become more in disengaged. Vascular dementia, uh, often thought of as the second most common cause of dementia. And it's often part of a mixed dementia. If I have vascular dementia and you look under the microscope, you will often see changes that go along with Alzheimer's disease as well. So it's often part of a mixed uh, condition. Uh, that can occur from a single stroke that occurs in just the right or, or wrong place. Uh, but then more often it's part of one of these bottom two categories, a lacunar state. Now a lacunar state means this. A lacunar stroke is a very small stroke, usually deep in the brain and believe it or not, may not cause any symptoms at all. I may have had a lacunar stroke and don't even know it. But when I start to have enough of these, the, the total volume, the total amount starts to add up and that can cause vascular cognitive impairment or vascular dementia. And, and really, I think almost un, in the same breath, I could say subcortical atherosclerotic disease. So what, is, what does that really mean? That really refers to a uh, progressive plaque buildup in the arteries and small blood vessels into the brain. And as that occurs, we can have more of a slowly progressive condition, looks a little bit like Alzheimer's disease. So instead of a discrete stroke where I can say yesterday at 2 p.m. I had a stroke, this is something more insidious. And it's thought that as you have that plaque buildup or atherosclerosis in the blood vessels, we lose the ability to provide blood flow, oxygen, nutrients to the brain, and that starts to cause some of these problems. And, and we often refer to something called a frontal subcortical circuit. The, the, the names, the terms aren't really that important, but what it means is this, we will see impairments in executive function. That's our ability to organize, to plan, to carry out complicated tasks. Attention, I may not be able to focus like I used to. My working memory, I'm not able to hold things in my head as I'm, I'm working through problems as well. My overall speed may be slower. Uh, physically, we may see some changes as well. So with Alzheimer's disease, we typically don't see physical changes through most of the disease course, but with vascular cognitive impairment or vascular dementia, we may, we may see uh, physically, I'm just slower. I walk more slowly. 
my balance may be off. I may look a little bit like I have Parkinson's when I'm walking and I may have more trouble uh, controlling my bladder. Uh, I may appear depressed, I may be depressed, or I may uh, just be apathetic. I, I don't have interest, I don't have drive. I'm, I'm very content to just sit there. And this is what we may see on, a, on an MRI scan. So this is a typical MRI scan and at the top of the screen would be the front of my head and the bottom of the screen would be the back of the head. And these kind of fluffy white areas are what I wanna draw your attention to. Those are signs of underlying vascular disease or atherosclerosis. And so if we see a scan like this, it does not prove someone has vascular disease, but it's a strong clue that vascular disease may be playing a role in this. Now, next in order of importance, I would say is dementia with Lewy bodies. And, and some core features with that, we see pretty marked fluctuations from hour to hour, day to day, we will see uh, hallucinations, particularly well-formed visual hallucinations. May see some spontaneous features that look like Parkinsonism. Tremor doesn't seem to be quite as common, but we'll often see stiffness, slow, slowness, trouble getting out of a chair, trouble walking. We'll often see something called REM behavior disorder. Essentially, this is a tendency to act out dreams. When we dream, normally uh, we are paralyzed from the neck down in order to not act out those dreams. It's a protective mechanism. If that breaks down, we can start to act out our dreams and these can be very violent. People will jump out of bed and tackle a, a dresser thinking they're attacking an intruder and can get quite injured. And then there are a number of other features that you may or may not see. Uh, the, uh, the two most common that I see are uh, fa repeated falls and syncope, basically fainting spells. And then frontotemporal low bar dementia, I, I said before, and I'll stick to this, I'm not going to say very much about those. We often see a, a couple of different sort of syndromes, if you will. There may be very significant changes in behavior or personality, becoming very disinhibited, it's often described as losing your filter, saying things that are out of character, doing things that are out of character. It can be just the opposite, a profound apathy, just a, a lack of interest in doing anything. Uh, and then in other cases, it may really affect language. We call it a, a, a type of aphasia. You may see memory problems, but that's often not prominent. And it's often said you might see Parkinsonism, symptoms that look like Parkinson's disease. In my experience, I have not tended to see that, but it's often been described. So that's kind of a high level overview of, of dementia and the causes of dementia. Let's talk about treatment now. And then uh, from there, we'll progress into um, some of what I, I hope are our future treatments in the not too distant future. Uh, so current management, uh, when we think of medications, we think of cognitive enhancers and they work in a couple different systems in the brain, the cholinergic, the glutamatergic, we'll talk about that. And then uh, uh, we employ different strategies to help with behavioral symptoms, whether that be depression or anxiety or hallucinations, delusions. So when we think about uh, cognitive enhancers, uh, the first theory we need to understand or hypothesis is the cholinergic hypothesis. Now in the brain, there are different sets of neurons, brain cells that communicate using different chemicals or neurotransmitters. One of those systems uses acetylcholine. And that's where the name cholinergic system and, and cholinergic hypothesis came from. Well, early on, it was felt that a deficiency in that system, the cholinergic system, may be uh, to blame for some of the symptoms we see in Alzheimer's disease. And so the thought was, if we could augment that cholinergic function, maybe we would see an improvement in memory. And, and generally, that has been true. So this is a little bit of a, a busy slide, I realize. What I'm trying to show you is a synapse. A synapse is the meeting point of two brain cells or neurons, and that's how they communicate. They send signals back and forth. 
So on the left-hand side is one neuron uh, that is trying to send a signal, a message to communicate with the neuron on the right-hand side. And the little green balls, they look like peas, are acetylcholine. So that's the messenger. So the first nerve cell releases acetylcholine, the second uh, neuron receives the acetylcholine, and that's how we send a message. And in that sense, we may form or recall a memory, if you will. Now, for this system to work properly, you want to send the signal as a quick pulse, and then you want it cleared out of the system. You don't want it just hanging around there, constantly irritating that other cell. So we have enzymes called cholinesterases, and these are the little black bars. So you send the signal, you receive it on the other end, and then you clear it out of the way immediately. Well, the problem in Alzheimer's disease, and really probably other uh, memory disorders, is that there's not enough of the message in the first place. So we are essentially clearing that message before it effectively reaches the other side. So if that's true, if we come up with medications that in a sense block these cholinesterases, we allow more of the signal to reach the other nerve, we more effectively send that signal, and in turn, we improve cognition, we improve memory and thinking. So that's where medications like Aricept or Dinepazil, Exelon, or the generic name is Rivacidigmine, and then Razadine, the generic name for it is Galantamine. That's where all of these medications come. They are all cholinesterase inhibitors. So they're in this case, the uh, yellow oval. What they're doing is blocking the cholinesterase. Now more of the signal gets to the other cell and we more effectively communicate. We more effectively send that signal through. So that led to uh, three medications that are still currently used, uh, Aricept, Exelon, and Razadine. The generic names for those are Dinepazil, Ribostigmine, Galantamine, and they all help. They all show similar benefit in terms of cognition. So if I'm on one of these medications, my memory scores will be better. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to think more clearly. I'm going to have less problem behaviors. I'm going to be less apt to be depressed or anxious or agitated. ADLs, my activities of daily living, I'm going to be more capable of either doing those independently or at least assisting with those. And, and this is an important point, the benefit is sustained with long-term treatment when you compare it to no treatment. It doesn't mean that this condition can't get worse over time, uh, but it means these medications still have an effect. This is a very old slide, and, and it was from the original studies with Aricept or Dinepazil, but I think it illustrates the point. So if you look to the far left, it kind of says zero, this is our starting point. If we start one of these medications, we improve above our baseline, but over time, if you follow this out to the right, we will still decline. But if you compare it to the shaded area, this is what we would look like if we were never on any treatment. So these medicines aren't the medicines we want. They're not preventing us from getting worse, but they do seem to still have a sustained benefit that Overall, if I'm taking this medication two years later, I'm still likely doing better than if I had never taken that medicine. So those are the cholinesterase inhibitors. Let me pivot now and talk about the glutamatergic hypothesis. So glutamate is another neurotransmitter. And it turns out that the normal activity of this system and this neurotransmitter is important in learning and memory or really cognition generally. And it also turns out that in dementia, this system is not working properly. So here's another target for us to try to treat. So we're, these are another series of synapses. So again, synapse is uh, the connection between neurons, between brain cells. And on the far left, this is what it looks like at rest. It's a little bit of noise in the system, but that's no big deal. And then when we go over to the right panel, we're trying to learn something. So somebody tells me their name and I'm trying to remember their name. I'm gonna release these little triangles, that's glutamate. I'm gonna send a signal to the next nerve. If you look below, I have a good signal to noise ratio. I've, I've 
uh, effectively communicated and hopefully formed that memory. So that's what we want things to look like. Now, in the next slide, this is what things look like with dementia. So in the far left, I'm at rest, but I have a lot of this glutamate that's out here between those two cells and it's irritating the cell. So it's causing a lot of noise here. Now, somebody tells me their name. I send a signal, but that signal is kind of lost in all of the noise. There's a lot of static. So I didn't really effectively communicate. And so I didn't effectively form that memory. Well, that's bad enough, but one concern is that over time, all of that irritation, all of that noise will lead to damage of the neuron, the brain cell, and I get a flat line there. That's where memantine or nemenda comes in. So again, we start to the far left. I've got a lot of noise in the system. Memantine seems to block that noise down. When we want to send a signal, it gets out of the way, but I've now restored that signal to noise ratio. So it's uh, improved that ability to signal using the glutamate system. And we think that's how it helps lead to improvements in memory and cognition. And when we measure that, we see either improvement or a slowed decline in terms of cognition, memory and thinking, in terms of behavior, particularly anxiety or agitation, in terms of activities of daily living, or we just measure function globally. Now, this medicine is approved for moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease, and that's reasonable to use it that way. I will tell you most experts in the field will use this medication pretty broadly, that we don't really see this as a disease that becomes something different as we progress through different stages. Uh, we will tend to treat this as a sort of broad dementia medication. So that gives you some idea as to the kind of current landscape. Let me talk a little bit about current research and, and what I think are some of the future treatments that are coming out. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about a few different uh, areas. Uh, it's important to go over something called the amyloid hypothesis, and that's driven a lot of the research uh, and a lot of the future treatments coming out. And along with that, I'll talk about something called biomarkers. Biomarkers are basically different things that we can study that we think indicate someone has a particular disease or marks how that disease is progressing. So these are often blood tests or scans or, or tests that we get from spinal fluid. Then I'm gonna talk about anti-amyloid strategies. We've had some successes and failures. And then I'm gonna finish up talking about prevention, which I think is a, an interesting new area to look at. Oh no. Okay, so the amyloid hypothesis. What it says is this, it's the deposition of a protein called beta amyloid, or you'll often hear it referred to as A beta in the brain. So the deposition of this protein in the brain is the key trigger in a long complex cascade that leads to Alzheimer's disease. Now, I don't mean to get too deep in the weeds, but uh, some of this I think is worth uh, going over. This protein comes from a larger protein called the amyloid precursor protein. And the gene that encodes for this is part of a highly conserved gene family. Well, why is that important? Well, when you hear that a gene is highly conserved, that we see that not just in humans, but throughout the whole animal kingdom, it tells you that this must serve some very important function. We don't entirely know what that function is, but it's thought that the amyloid precursor protein is important in development of the nervous system uh, in terms of the neuromuscular junction, so the connection between nerves and muscles that allow us to move, in synaptogenesis, the formation of those connections between nerve cells, uh, dendritic complexity, and that's just the complexity with which different nerve cells connect with one another. And the richer that is, the better off we seem to be. Uh, axon growth, again, that's part of the brain cell. Uh, and then synaptic function and plasticity, our ability to form new brain connections. So again, don't worry about all of those details. The important uh, message is the amyloid precursor protein uh, 
seems to have some very important roles. And a lot of that is centered around development of the nervous system and those connections between brain cells or nerve cells. Now, the amyloid precursor protein, like many protein, uh, is processed. So we make proteins and then we're constantly breaking them down, recycling them and making new ones. This particular protein is processed by enzymes called secretases and there's an alpha, beta and gamma. The alpha secretase uh, releases a fragment of this protein uh, that seems to be good. It seems to be neuroprotective in some way. So that's good. The beta secretase seems to break this protein down in the wrong way, in a sense, in a bad way, that creates this A beta, beta amyloid. And this is a different way of looking at that. So in the very center, this long uh, uh, sort of cylinder is the amyloid precursor protein. And that's, and it's normal, that's what we want. The bottom part is inside a brain cell, the top part is outside of the brain cell, and these sort of balls and squiggly lines is the cell membrane. And, and that's how this protein essentially normally functions. If we break it down with the alpha secretase, we go to the left. And that seems to be a good pathway. Again, this, for, this little fragment up here may be protective or helpful to brain cells, uh, and we're not creating any problems. But if we go to the right and we break it down with the beta secretase, that's when we eventually release these little fragments, the blue fragments that are A beta, beta amyloid, and then they start to clump together and they start to form plaques in the brain. A little different way of looking at it. In the top panel, we have the cell interior on that bottom left corner. And this long squiggly line is the amyloid precursor protein that extends out into the area outside of the cell. The scissors are uh, secretases and the scissor on the, maybe the far right or the center is the beta secretase. When we break it out in this way, these little fragments are released. Now, we are all doing this right now, but we release little enough that for most of us, we're clearing that out of the brain and it may not be too big a deal. But if we make too much of it, it clumps together and it forms these plaques. And you'll hear in Alzheimer's disease referred to as plaques and tangles. These are the plaques and it's thought that these plaques become toxic to the brain. So what is our evidence that this is really right? You may have heard in the press a lot of comments about, you know, the amyloid hypothesis may not be true. And in science, you always get a lot of evidence that both supports and refutes a particular hypothesis, although the support for this one is very strong. And I'm going to go over a few different ways that we have evidence for this, both in pathology, genetics, and biomarkers. So... If we look under a microscope, these are the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. A plaque here, which at the center is the protein we discussed, beta amyloid, and tangles over here, which consist of a different protein called tau. So that's what we see with the disease. That's what Alice Alzheimer noticed 116 years ago. What about genetics? Uh, so for most of us, we do not have a gene that tells us we will or will not get Alzheimer's disease. But there are a very small number of families that have particular genes, a mutation of a gene. And if they have that gene and they live long enough, they will have Alzheimer's disease. In most cases, that will occur in the 40s or 50s, very young. Uh, but the reason that's important is those mutations tend to fall in one of three genes, the APP, the amyloid precursor protein, which we've been talking about, or a couple of others called presenilins. And all of those work by increasing levels of amyloid. So the genetic cases that we know that are, we call them dominant, uh, work by increasing levels of amyloid in the brain. Down syndrome, virtually everyone with Down syndrome, if they live into their 50s or 60s, develop Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out Down syndrome is caused by a third copy of chromosome 21 where the amyloid precursor protein lives. So it's thought that the mechanism in Down syndrome, again, is an increased dosage of this amyloid precursor protein and therefore amyloid. Uh, 
The main risk gene for Alzheimer's disease is uh, ApoE and particularly E4. So if I inherit one or two copies of E4, it does not mean I will ever get Alzheimer's disease, but it does mean my risk is higher and it is also associated with higher levels of beta amyloid. Now there's something really interesting a few years ago uh, when a discovery was made, a gene mutation in Iceland. And if I am lucky enough to have this mutation, I seem to be protected against Alzheimer's disease. And this mutation occurs within that same gene, the amyloid precursor protein. But in this case, if I am lucky enough to have that mutation, it seems to block the beta secretase. So I'm not forming as much beta amyloid. And not only is that protective against Alzheimer's disease, that seems to even be protective against normal cognitive decline associated with aging. So there is some pretty compelling evidence from genetics that amyloid must be important. What about biomarkers? So I mentioned earlier, biomarkers uh, are measures that we can come up with that help us measure an underlying disease state. And many of these tend to be proteins. So for instance, we may study levels of amyloid. Right now we study that in spinal fluid, uh, but perhaps someday we'll be able to study that in blood samples as well. Or we can do a type of PET scan called an amyloid PET scan where we're measuring levels of amyloid in the brain. And maybe that will give us some measure of this disease um, that, that we can use. And then we look at markers of neurodegeneration. So tau, the protein I mentioned that's involved in neurofibrillary tangles, we see that in neurodegeneration in general. So if my brain cells are breaking down, I will likely have higher levels of tau in my spinal fluid. And we can also do PET scans in a, from a research setting that are looking at levels of tau in the brain. And then with an MRI, we can try to measure atrophy. This one's a little tricky. All of us, as we are getting older, our brains are getting smaller, that's atrophy. That doesn't mean they're not working just as well. It doesn't necessarily mean a disease state, but we're working on ways to try to measure atrophy and separate out what's normal shrinkage, if you will, of the brain and what's abnormal shrinkage of the brain. So when we look at those biomarkers, we do seem to see a cascade of events that supports this amyloid hypothesis. So the first thing we see is deposition of amyloid. Then we start to see a breakdown of the connections between nerve cells and you start seeing increasing levels of tau. After that, the brain starts atrophying at an accelerated rate. And then the last thing we see is cognitive decline. That all goes along with what we would predict from the amyloid hypothesis. This is maybe a better way of looking at it. If we measure amyloid, the very first thing we see is a big increase in amyloid. That's that right curve. The next thing we see are increasing levels of tau. The next thing we see green is uh, atrophy of the brain. And then it's only when you get to that far right-hand side that you see increasing problems with memory or increasing problems clinically. So a lot of these changes occur before we ever have any symptoms at all. In fact, it's thought that this starts uh, 20 years before I have any cognitive changes. So I, I hope not, but it is entirely possible that I'm somewhere here. I'm developing amyloid, but I won't actually see any signs of that for another 10, 20 years. So biomarkers give us a lot of evidence in favor of the amyloid hypothesis as well. So what are some of the strategies? One of the ideas has been to uh, reduce the production of amyloid. So if we can block those secretases, we stop the formation of beta amyloid. That's a good idea, but we haven't come up with the right treatment. And the, and the medications that we have come up with often have more side effects than we like. So, so we haven't done very well on that. Anti-aggregants. So we allow the beta amyloid to form, but we stop it from clumping together and the hope is that allows the brain to clear it out more effectively. That's a good hypothesis. That hasn't worked yet either. Uh, 
a lot of what you see is based on immunologic therapy. So therapies that are trying to use our own immune system to clear amyloid out of the brain. And this really started a bit of history uh, 23 years ago now, when it was shown in mice, mice that develop Alzheimer's disease, that you can vaccinate them against beta amyloid or A-beta. And if you do that, the mice have less changes that go along with Alzheimer's disease. They seem to do better. And there was even a trial in people immunizing humans with Alzheimer's disease against amyloid it, with uh, really not very good results. There were some serious side effects and those were stopped. But there has been a lot of interest in trying to use the immune system uh, to help us ever since. So we've had a lot of failures. We've tried secretase inhibitors, blocking the formation of beta amyloid, looking at both the gamma and the beta secretase, and those have not worked. We've tried different monoclonal antibodies, antibodies we developed in the laboratory, and then we give to people with uh, Alzheimer's disease with the hope that that clears amyloid out of the brain and we prevent uh, or at least stop the progression of this disease. We've had a lot of failures as well. And with all of those failures has been a pretty healthy criticism of the amyloid hypothesis. Maybe we're going in the wrong direction. Well, there are other potential reasons this could fail. Uh, and, as a parallel, we've seen a lot of this in the stroke world where strategies that now are considered fairly revolutionary, that are really helping quite a lot uh, with stroke, uh, went through 20 to 30 years of failure. And it may have been because we were selecting the wrong patients or we were intervening too late. So if you look at this curve again, if I start over here in the MCI era, area, to get rid of amyloid, well, it may be too late. I may have already done too much damage from all the beta amyloid that's accumulated. What if we go earlier and earlier and earlier? What if we try to intervene before we start seeing as much cognitive decline? And that led us in 2016 to what seemed like really exciting news, a new medicine, aducanumab. It's now known as Adjuhelm. It's a antibody that's targeting beta amyloid. In their initial studies, they showed that they slowed progression of Alzheimer's disease by 70%, which is just amazing. Uh, and so they, they sort of skipped ahead and did two large phase three trials. These are the final trials that are usually done to prove a medication works. And if we pass that stage, then the FDA will typically approve these medications and we have them available to us. And it was thought that maybe the early success was we focused so early on the disease course here. We started patients very, very early in their disease course. Well, uh, this is just looking at the initial studies. And you can see by one measure, we reduced progression by 57%, by one, by 76%. Those are really big numbers. So we did the phase three trials and it was stopped early based on something called a futility analysis. Uh, they look at the data through different parts of the study. And if it looks like statistically, mathematically, there's no way that we're gonna show both of these studies are going to be successful, there's no point in continuing. And it uh, triggered that analysis and basically was stopped because based on the data they had, it did not appear that there was any chance this could be effective. There are a couple of graphs. What you want to see with these graphs are the bars really pointing downwards. Particularly, you want to see a gradation, a little down with green, more down with blue. And if you just look at this, it looks like this was a highly successful trial. That was one of the two trials they did, 302. But if you look at the other parallel trial, you don't see that at all. And in some cases, the blue bar is above that line, meaning patients on the medication did worse than if they hadn't been on the medication at all. So you kind of have a mixed uh, bag there. One of the two studies looked good, one of the two studies did not show a benefit. And the conclusion you would typically make is, we don't see a clear benefit from this medication. Well, the FDA surprised all of us. Uh, they had an advisory panel that said, no, you need to do more research. 
the FDA approved this medication despite that advisory uh, panel's recommendations, but they did something interesting. They approved it for the removal of amyloid, and it absolutely does remove amyloid. Uh, and they said, we think the removal of amyloid is likely to help with the disease. So even though it didn't show a clear benefit clinically, we think it's a good medication. And then they amended it to say, well, this is just for very early disease. And this is showing the, the PET scans. On the left are people that did not receive the medication and the right are people that did receive the medications. And essentially what you see, the, the colors change from red to blue, they removed amyloid. So there is no question that this medication removes amyloid from the brain. It also has some side effects, and this is important, not just for this medication, but this you're going to see this in future medications that come out as well. Something called ARIA. So the overall risk of serious adverse events, serious side effects, is about the same between those that got the medicine and those that got a placebo. So overall, this looks like a pretty good medicine, but there's something called ARIA. And these are changes you see on the MRI that are related to amylo anti-amyloid medications. And you see that over 40% on the medication had these side effects compared to 10% that were on placebo. Most of the time, people didn't know they had those side effects. We only saw it because we were doing MRIs uh, more or less once a month. So only about 7.5% had symptoms. And only about one and a half percent were they really serious. Uh, most of the time it resolved spontaneously on its own, but nevertheless, there were people who had these side effects and that's important to notice. So what or note, what are these side effects? Well, if you look on an MRI, you'll see edema or swelling, or you'll see micro hemorrhages, little tiny areas of microscopic bleeding. The symptoms you'll see may be headache, nausea, confusion, or visual disturbance. And if we look at an MRI, at that top panel, there you have some swelling that you can kind of see. And on the bottom panel, these little black dots are areas of microscopic hemorrhage that you can pick up on an MRI. Now, what's been the story then over the past year? Many insurance companies uh, refused to pay for the medication. CMS, who administers Medicare, finally decided we will pay for it, but only in the setting of a clinical trial as part of a research study. And to a large degree, this has um, this has really led to very limited use of this medication, and, and it's not clear where this is going to go. Uh, but there are another series of medications that are similar that we're going to hear a lot more about uh, probably at the end of this month. So the next one uh, to really pay attention to, I believe, is lecanemab. It's also a monoclonal antibody. It's aimed against beta amyloid, say protofibrils. That's when it's just starting to clump together. Uh, this would be a biweekly IV treatment, so getting an IV infusion every two weeks. And the initial results were announced. We don't have the whole story yet, but the initial results showed that it slowed cognitive decline by a little over a quarter, which is significant in my opinion. It was positive on all measures. The rate of aria, the, the swelling or bleeding in the brain, in this case is about half of what we saw with aducanumab, about 21% versus 9% getting placebo and it causes symptoms in about 3%. So still something we should keep our eyes on, but, but looks better. We are gonna see the final results of this presented at uh, an important uh, meeting in San Francisco at the end of this month called CTAD. And if those results hold up to their initial report, then I, I think this will be a very major step forward for our field. Uh, and they indicate that they wish to apply to the FDA for full approval by the end of the first quarter next year. So this time next year, uh, and hopefully earlier than this time next year, we may have a new treatment that we can use. Now, there are, of course, a lot of other medications in the pipeline. Uh, the first two, denanumab and gantanirumab, we also will probably hear about at this same meeting. Uh, 
their same mechanism, antibodies against amyloid, but the uh, at least the early rumors are these uh, treatments, one or both of these may also have very positive results. And then a, a base inhibitor. This is really trying to block the beta secretase that we talked about earlier. There are medications uh, targeting tau, which we see in neurofibrillary tangles. There are medications that are trying to work on neuroinflammation, inflammation in the brain that might be a mechanism uh, in conjunction with or separate from uh, amyloid leading to dementia. And then neuroprotection, medications that help protect brain cells against any of these other insults. Now, in just the last couple of minutes, let me pivot to uh, prevention. I, I mentioned this before, but it's worth saying again, the changes in the brain leading to Alzheimer's disease and probably other dementias begins about 20 years before symptom onset. So rather than looking at people in their 60s and 70s, should we be focused on people in their 40s and 50s? And looking at potential lifestyle changes in midlife that can reduce that risk for cognitive decline. Now there's a Lancet Commission and they've issued two reports. Uh, one I believe was in 2015 and the last one was in 2020. Uh, and they have now made the statement that approximately 40% of dementia worldwide is preventable, 40%. Now, that's a big number and they've identified 12 risk factors. So. Uh, some of those we can do something about individually. So less education, hearing loss, traumatic brain injury, high blood pressure, excessive alcohol, obesity, smoking, depression, social isolation, physical inactivity, diabetes, and air pollution. If we could do something about all of those, we may be able to meaningfully reduce our own risk of dementia and the overall burden of dementia across the world. And is just a couple of examples how this may come into play. There have been studies that have shown if we reduced certain vascular risk factors, not completely, just by 25%. Those are diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity. So if we reduce diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity by 25%, we would reduce the number of cases of Alzheimer's disease in the U.S. by a quarter million. If we reduce sedentary behavior by 25%, again, not fixing it, just reduced it by 25%, that would reduce another quarter million cases. If we uh, look at uh, seven risk factors, and you see them listed there, diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, smoking, depression, and education slash cognitive in inactivity. So we don't have to just focus on education uh, in early life, but cognitive activity throughout life, we could prevent 3 million cases worldwide and nearly half a million cases in the US. Uh, so that's pretty remarkable. So what are some of our uh, future directions? So uh, in research, I think we'll continue to work on development of biomarkers. It's a very hot field now looking at blood biomarkers. Uh, even though I can tell you a spinal fluid exam isn't a big deal, I'd still much rather have a blood test than a spinal fluid exam. So we're working on trying to de develop some of those tests that will allow us to both better detect conditions like Alzheimer's disease, but also to treat them more effectively. Uh, continuing to focus on anti-amyloid strategies, I, I don't think that area is dead. I think it's fair to say Perhaps that's not the whole story, but it's still very important. And, and that'll continue to be a focus. Continue to focus on non-amyloid strategies as well, like inflammation. And I think we're gonna see more and more focus on uh, risk factors and early interventions for prevention. Uh, I think we'll find that it'll be even better if we can prevent this disease uh, than, than to treat it if it's all possible. Uh, and, this tells me that I've reached the end of, uh, end of my slides.